And so, first, very briefly, there's, there's been, uh, around the world, uh, the approach we and the Prius group in Rotterdam have taken has pretty much been the same. We do DRE and PSA every three months for two years to get a baseline, then every six months. We do a biopsy, the key confirmatory biopsy within the first year. It's crucial because you are targeting the anterolateral and anterior prostate, the areas that got missed on the first one. And if both of those first biopsies show, show uh, nothing more than small volume Gleason 6, then we do it every three or, three or even five years and stop at age 80. There's a, a multi uh, institutional group in the United States that includes British Columbia uh, Center that does something similar, PSA every six to 12 months, biopsy at 18 months and every one to three years. And then there's Bell Carter at Johns Hopkins where they do a biopsy annually until age 75. That's where the data on the erectile dysfunction after three or more biopsies comes from. Uh, and these are the triggers for intervention in the various surveillance series. So you can see there's a lot of similarity. Everyone uses grade progression. And actually, this may be too stringent. I'm going to get to that in a minute. But clearly, progression to a significant amount of Gleason 4, uh, you're all familiar with Peter Albertson's data showing that once you have Gleason uh, 7, the mortality rate untreated at 20 years is about three times higher than with Gleason 6. Uh, and, you know, everyone takes Gleason 4 seriously. We have used PSA doubling time. Some people have used velocity and clinical progression with a nodule, which is pretty rare in these patients. So that is a summary of the data and the, the approach that is out there. Now, I just want to, I want to make basically three points that I think are crucial. The first one is this phenomenon of grade inflation that has occurred since 2005. And uh, as probably most of you are aware, there was a shift from the traditional Gleason scoring system, which was the primary and secondary patterns, to the sum of the primary grade and the highest grade. The idea was if the small Gleason 4 or 5 uh, lesion may determine the natural history. It makes perfect sense. But here is the problem. The problem, what it means is, if the patient has even a tiny amount of Gleason 4 or 5, they become a 7 or an 8. And the problem is artifact related to tangential cutting of a Gleason 3 acinus. And so the, the key difference between Gleason 3 and 4, it's a low power assessment, is the presence of a lumen. Gleason 3 has a lumen. Gleason 4 does not have a lumen. And you can imagine if a needle tangentially cuts a Gleason 3 acinus, the cells will have no lumen. It's been missed. And the pathologist will call it a 4. And this is an example of this, where the initial showed, level 1 showed Gleason 4. They cut deeper. There is the lumen. It's a 3. So only a pathologist who's really committed to this, who says, aha, you know, that doesn't look too convincing, and he goes back to the block and does serial sections. That's what they have to do to sort this out. There's also some stromal effects you get with higher grade cancer that a very skilled guy may, may pick up. But this turns out to be an issue in 25% of these surveillance candidates where you have small volume of disease, and it's very easy to make that error. Uh, and the concordance in that kind of situation is low. And here's one example of, of, uh, from, from one center, from traditional to modified Gleason, the Gleason 7 went from 26 to 68%. So in these patients, finding a little bit of Gleason 4 may be misleading. It may be an artifact. That's the first point. The second point, and this kind of supports this observation, is that in the studies that are out there that have looked at surveillance in Gleason 3 plus 4, we did between 1995 and 2000. We had about 60 patients with Gleason 7 who were over 70. In our series, it made it, uh, the presence of Gleason seven, uh, pattern four, Gleason seven, was not predictive at all of uh, progression to uh, requiring treatment. This is the um, San Francisco group, Matt Cooperberg and Peter Carroll. 90 men with intermediate risk disease, which was either PSA above 10 or Gleason seven, 
A third of them were Gleason 7. No difference in any outcome compared to low risk. And actually, the intermediate risk did a little better in terms of the proportion of patients requiring treatment. And um, this is the study from uh, the Prius group, 50 men with Gleason 7, uh, 44 Gleason 3 plus 4. Amongst the ones who otherwise were suitable candidates for surveillance, I mean, they, they fulfilled the Epstein criteria, except that they had elements of Gleason 4. There's the progression rate. It's really look very impressive out to six or seven years. None of the patients died of prostate cancer. So again, supporting the idea that having three plus a little four isn't a seven the way we used to think of it. And I mean, it has been an axiom, as far as I'm concerned, my whole career, that Gleason 7 prostate cancer should be treated radically and um, amongst younger patients. And I think that is now deserves to change. So great inflation is a reality. There's this artifact of the tangential cut that I think everyone needs to be aware of. It, it, Gleason 3 plus 4 appears to have lost its prognostic uh, significance and we shouldn't jump to treat these patients. The next is the issue of the PSA kinetics. This is not a good story. Here is our distribution of PSA doubling time in our cohort, median seven years, 20% of patients had a doubling time less than three years. We used that as a trigger for treatment for for uh, about 12 or 13 years, but there's, there's two huge problems with it. One is it's, uh, the PSA kinetics are, uh, are variable, are labile. So we looked at the 300 core patients in our cohort who were completely stable. No PSA, no uh, metastasis, no treatment, no deaths from prostate cancer. Among these stable patients, Half of them had a PSA velocity greater than two at some point during follow-up, an average of two times, sorry. Uh, PSA doubling time less than three years calculated using a simpler approach than we used. Half of them had a PSA doubling time less than three years at some point, a, a, an average of three times. So, just, so the PSA triggers that are commonly used are just all over the map over the course of time in these patients. And then uh, the... The Carter uh, uh, group at Hopkins also published their data showing not predictive of adverse biopsy findings or, or pathology. And then this, to me, was the death knell of this story, an overview by Andrew Vickers, all the studies on PSA kinetics with more than 200 patients, the performance, worse area under the curve, worse, 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 basically no difference. I think there's one that was borderline positive and was, had some technical flaws. Here's the conclusion. Little evidence that pretreatment PSA velocity or doubling time are of value for early stage prostate cancer. So PSA kinetics doesn't really work as a reliable trigger for intervention. I am not willing to give up on it completely. I do think that, I mean, for example, amongst the five deaths we had, they all had a short PSA doubling time. It does mean something. You can't rely on it. It's a flag. Go and do an MRI or repeat the biopsy. PC3, Marcus mentioned something about this. This is a summary of the six studies. Gleason score seven or greater. Can it predict that? And yes, no, yes, no, 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 in terms of whether the p-value was significant. So uh, the jury is still out. PC3 to me looks quite interesting, but that's the data. Uh, we've collaborated with the Orion group, which is a systems pathology approach that measures about 50 uh, different uh, readouts on the uh, actual prostate cancer slides from the biopsy. Uh, every possible pathway involved in prostate cancer progression. And uh, in a, we, we sent them uh, uh, several hundred biopsy slides from our patients, and actually it performed quite well in terms of predicting progression. And this was presented at the AUA last year. The problem is the company went bankrupt about four months ago. It, it's a very interesting, compelling assay, uh, but it just shows the difficulty in bringing a, a bioassay to market. And then I mentioned uh, uh, this bit uh, as a... Uh, um, new uh, approach to trying to identify these patients with uh, 
fusion of the MR image with the, uh, with the ultrasound. So what we are now doing as a trigger, we're no longer relying on PSA kinetics. The patient who, in whom something doesn't smell right has an MRI. I think multiparametric. Ideally, all these patients going on surveillance would get an MRI. We can't do that in Canada. We don't have the MR resources. Uh, the price in the U.S. is exorbitantly expensive. It may not be feasible, but you heard what Dr. Barrett said, that the price could be as low as a couple of hundred dollars. That makes it very compelling. Ultimately, it, the trigger is the patient. It comes down to the patient preferences, the trade-off of side effects, the survival benefit, the risk of disease recurrence, the value placed on his present quality of life versus the future, because the side effects occur today, the death occurs in many years. So finally, what I think the current controversies are. You repeat the biopsy, there's an increase in grease in three volume. My view is that that is not significant, except the greater the volume, the greater the risk of occult Gleason 4 can or 5 cancer somewhere else. So you watch those patients more carefully, but you do not have to treat that Gleason 3 pattern. It is not a real cancer, in my opinion, and others. The PSA kinetics is a flag only. Beware of 3 plus small volume 4. It may not be real. PCA3 I mentioned. Another controversy is the role of template or mapping biopsies transperineal, biopsying every cc of the prostate with 40, 50, or 100 cores, which is being promoted by Dave Crawford and some others. <clears throat> there, to me, this is a, a, a crude approach to sorting out what's going on in the prostate. It's like an excisional biopsy of the prostate through the biopsy needle, and it's not appealing to me, but there are some people who are interested in this. Finally, I think MR is going to ultimately save the day in this area and have a huge role. Thank you very much. I guess we have time for one or two questions, if we have some. I, I just have one question for myself, uh, and it's uh, how, how frequently these patients should be biopsied. I think annual biopsy, I can agree with Marcus Greffen that it's, if we should do this annually up to the age of 75, I think it's better to have a red protect me from the beginning. I, I can say in, this, in Gothenburg Center, we have far from that. We have biopsy of these men maybe once every five, fifth year or something like that. Do you so, have any ideas? What do you recommend? How, so, how frequently so should it be? Why do the, why re, the, the reason to peep, the, there's two reasons. One is to identify what you've missed. By far, that is the most important reason. The other is to find grade progression. All the evidence suggests that grade progression of Gleason 3 cancer to worse cancer is rare. It maybe is in a few percent of patients over many years. So to me, that should not drive a, a regular biopsy. It, once you can be confident that you are not missing something in the patient's prostate, I think the biopsies can be very infrequent. So what do you recommend? Every three we, years? We, we do it between every three and five years, depending on a number of things. What's the PSA kinetics doing? How old is the patient? What is his risk tolerance? Ultimately, I believe MR is, if, if it's true that negative MR has a 95% predictive, negative predictive value for clinically significant disease, we'll be able to stop biopsying these guys. One, one last question, then we have yeah, Actually, I'm talking tomorrow, but I'm afraid I will not have enough time to make all my points. Uh, as a pathologist, <laughs> I'll just make two statements. I mean, progression from grade 3 to grade uh, 4 is rare, but sampling errors is very frequent, so we have very often progression from Gleason 3 to 4 in reality. And the other thing, I would really remind you all that Gleason 7 is, is a bad thing to talk about, and if you look at studies, where Gleason 7 is used as one group, this is really bad because 3 plus 4 and 4 plus 3 are extremely different, and even the percentage of Gleason 4 makes a big difference. So any studies that compare data with Gleason 7 and 8 and, and 6 groups are, have a very major flaw. So this is all Thank for the you. moment. <laughs> this comment, and well, so with more research, we actually know that we know less that we knew two years ago, at least that's my, that's my impression, and now I would like to call uh, Alex Lotta.